Good evening. I'm Ron Burgundy. No, not really. But this is the special news channel, Quasi Ozzy Impossible. And we do have the story of the decade here for you tonight, folks. The following report focuses on the intersection between gender and the environment. Addressing such questions as the notion of sustainability, the link between gender and environmental justice, and how we as people consume and intermingle on this shared planet. We will unpack for you elements of this complex topic, featuring specifically population growth, consumption, and a special report on environmental justice. As always here at Quasi Aussie Posse, your trail to education in the outdoors, we will bring you in this segment to the forefront of this fascinating debate grounded on extensive investigation, reports from the field, and relentless questioning that will interrogate the very fabric of human existence and purpose. First tonight, I will turn to my colleague and co-anchor, resident expert in population dynamics, Maggie Magpie. Recent reports emphasize that we cannot ignore the impact that population has on the environment. The world population reached 1 billion sometime between 1800 and 1830, and it is expected to project, it's projected to reach 8 billion by 2030. This growth, along with rising incomes, increases the demand and cost of natural resources. Paul Ehrlich was one of the first population researchers who warned that this growth would pose a threat to ecosystems and the well-being of humans. Policies that attempt to address overpopulation frequently target low-income women who are in these minority groups. For example, thousands of women who are mostly Native American, Hispanic, or African American were forced to be sterilized in the late 1960s. In 1976, about 8 million Indians underwent sterilization in a program that targeted both men and women. Due to the one-child policy in China, along with male preference and female abandonment, populations have been skewed. On the other hand, male Japanese leaders have urged women who have children for their country, going so far as to call them birth-giving machines. Furthermore, more women die than men in natural disasters, as many are expected to carry children and the elderly on evacuation. Additionally, they tend to be in private spaces with little access to evacuation, as opposed to men who are in public spaces with well-defined evacuation routes. We all know that narratives frequently portray conflict as human well-being versus environmental sustainability. But Nicole de Traz, author of Gender and the Environment, claims humans should not try to dominate the environment, but rather work with it and coexist in a sustainable way. And here's Jody with a special report on environmental justice. Thank you, Maggie and Asher. As argued by Nicole de Traz, gender is an essential but often neglected aspect of environmental unfairness. Groups that are most likely to bear the environmental change are those in society who face other disproportionate discrimination, racial and ethnic minorities, women, and other marginalized groups. For instance, communities of color face increased exposure to hazardous materials because companies cite toxic facilities in their neighborhood. This shows that inequalities exist in regard of decision-making and unequal enforcement of environmental regulations by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Gender norms are linked to institutional structures that directly influence power relations and distribution of social benefits. White men feel less vulnerable to many risks than do women and people of color, and are more accepting of such risks. This is thought to be due to their dominant position in social structures. A study has found that conservative white males are more likely than other adults to express climate change denial. Absolutely no politician comes to mind. This discrepancy can also be seen in the indigenous community of Canada about the Trans Mountain Pipeline, a pipeline expansion project where Chief Kukpai 7 Judy Wilson, Secretary Treasurer of the BC Union of Indian Chiefs, voices that this project is not viable because of opposition to it from other First Nation communities along the proposed route. On the other hand, Stephen Buffalo, president and CEO of the Indian Resource Council, argued that the project potential revenues could be a great opportunity to invest in communities that are underfunded by the Canadian government. In addition, one of the most frequently mentioned connections between environmental justice and gender has been considerations of women involvement in environmental movements in general and environmental justice movements in particular. In the U.S., women lead many prominent grassroots environmental justice organizations, while men make up a considerable percentage of large-scale mainstream environmental and conservative groups. Women, and particularly women of color, are heavily represented as the heads of environmental justice associations. Back to you. Now let's turn to Brooke Bandicoot. 
for a special look at the dynamics of population consumption. Consumption refers to using something up, and overconsumption occurs when too much of our use resources are used. This is a major problem in our society, but is also socially conditioned to influence how men and women consume. The individualization of responsibility can be defined as making the individual consumer responsible for their, their effect on the environment. In some cases, this theory supports that women are more likely to carry on this individual responsibility. In Europe, statistics show that women walk and use public transportation more. In Sweden, women's unpaid or invisible labor means that, that they are more likely to buy basic household essentials like food and clothing, while men are more likely to purchase expensive capital goods as well as to be the registered owners of things like cars, homes, and electronics, suggesting that women are more likely to be smaller consumers. This alludes to the importance of men's crucial role in addressing climate change and sustainable development. Without their individual responsibility, the degradation of, of the environment and gender gap may continue to increase. According to Nicole Detraz, while this is part of the story, patterns of consumption are much more complex. Gender lenses aid in understanding the multiple, multifaceted processes of consumption, how they connect to sustainability, and how they intersect with debates about fairness and equity. Thinking about gender requires us to reflect on why and how we consume the way we do. It challenges us to question ass assertions that capitalism and technology are the best options for moderating consumption and the environmental negatives that accompany it. Now back to Asher for thoughts about sustainability. Okay. The idea of sustainability, for as long as it's been around, has been linked to society and human behavior. In essence, the choices we make to manage ourselves dictate the choices we make to manage our environment. This is especially clear in the 1995 Beijing Conference on Women. The resulting declaration was a commitment to eradicate poverty, but the report states that this requires the involvement of women in economic and social development, equal opportunities, and the full and equal participation. But what exactly does this mean? Nicole Detraz argues that empowerment and agency are the two are the foremost tools to undergo this transition. They challenge notions of sustainability by probing power relations, especially in these male-dominated spheres. No clearer is this than the example of Rachel, Rachel Carson, who in 1962 released a book called Silent Spring, publicizing the threat DDT and other pesticides posed to human life and well-being. But she was ridiculed and made fun of publicly. No scientist believed her because she was a woman, even though her findings were solid. And within a decade, DDT was outlawed in the United States, and she protected who knows how many people. I'll end with a quote from Nicole Detras, who says that feminists join other critics in challenging the belief that by seeking only incremental changes, we will be able to bring about the real transformations that will be required to realize a sustainable society. And now, let's look at a special interview conducted by Maggie Magpie. So where are you from? Uh, oh, okay, cool. So how do, you, how do you think climate change is affecting this area? So much. Like this season alone, it's so warm. Like this is the warmest winter I have ever experienced. So do you think that the strain of environmental change is unbalanced for certain groups, like based on gender or income or race? So the effects is going to be unbalanced? Or? Yeah, like do some people experience like the, I guess like climate change more than others? Other people definitely will. I mean like people that are living in rural areas, particularly in Australia, they're not really on the coast, so drought will affect them more severely. Um, also we've seen with like uh, temperature change, I know when I was in Vietnam, uh, it was unseasonably cold and they, uh, a bunch of old people died, like just in their sleep, they couldn't cope with, because they didn't have the proper uh, like insulation in their home, so they passed away in their sleep. And it wasn't even like that cold, but like for them, it yeah. was, so that's definitely what you will see, is like people that don't have those securities in place are so much more vulnerable, which will be older people, children, um, homeless. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for tuning in tonight to the Quasi Aussie Posse. Your trail in outdoor education. Stay classy, Sydney. <laughs>